All right, welcome back to the Her Advantage podcast. I'm your host, Mel, and with me, I have the most divine human being, Louise Diesel. She is a life coach for women and families and specializes in relationship dynamics, childhood, healing childhood and generational trauma. Louise, how are you? Oh, I'm so happy to be here. (laughs) So grateful. We have had a little bit of a, we booked this in ages ago and we've had, we both had things happen. And so it's really exciting that we have finally hit record, but not without our tech issues to start off with, which is always an indicator of a great podcast to come. How, so Louise, do you want to go into a little bit about, introduce yourself, introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you and how did we meet? Okay. So I am a wife and a mother. I live in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, I have three children. At the moment, I have two 21-year-old boys. They are 10 months apart. So for six months, six weeks of the year, they are the same age. I can't believe I have 21-year-olds. I was joking with my husband the other day. I said, um, can you believe we have two adults in the home? And he said, no, until they're fully independent, they're not adults. They're still children. (laughs) Um, And a 16-year-old daughter um and family is really important to me and empowering family so um years ago it wasn't a plan but I ended up becoming a coach and I've been a coach now for 17 years and because of my own journey and what's most meaningful to me I have specialized in working with women and families and mothers parents are fathers too I work with fathers and I work with young adults and I've worked with a few kids um, empowering a family and healing families is what's most meaningful to me. I had a question come to mind. Um, so Louise and I met in a coaching membership in 2020, I think. Um, I had a question. So like Louise has just said, she's in Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm in Adelaide, South Australia. How did you meet or come into Tanya's world? So I was a student of Dr. John D. Martini's, and um, so was Tanya. I think I started just maybe a year before her. Um, and she would come sometimes to South Africa to do some of the courses. So we met and we became friends and we've been friends ever since. Um, we've had a beautiful journey. I love her to bits. Yeah, she's a brilliant human being. And I think that one of her unspoken about secret powers is that power of connection and bringing everyone together mm-hmm. so we had a beautiful journey and yeah I just love it absolutely um yeah well again I'll talk about Tanya later but who were you before you were a coach and how did you get into that line of work oh I um was a businesswoman I'm running my own business I had um a printing company and a photography business. Uh, Printing company started, was our main um, form of income. And um, I was, I was raised by my family to, and my dad basically told me you will be a, you will go into business. Um, I wanted to be, I always wanted to be a teacher. And my dad said, I can't be a teacher because then I make enough money and you will study business. And so I ended up in business and I'm really grateful because Um, My husband and I have a successful printing company and I used to have a a really successful photography business for many years. But then I started coaching as well. And to have three small kids and running three businesses just got too much. So I eventually closed the um, photography business because coaching is my real calling. Um, So, yeah, I'm a a businesswoman as well. And I think one of the things that um, I love about my coaching and my clients can resonate is that I can I can resonate with being a mother and a businesswoman and a working mom. Um, I used to be really driven to want to succeed because I grew up believing I wasn't enough. And so I really pushed myself to succeed in, in all areas of life and particularly business. Uh, and at some point that wasn't enough. And that's kind of what led me on a journey, which eventually led me to become a coach. I was going to say, you know, if you're pushing to succeed at all areas of life, what does that look like? And what is what are you missing when that happens? So, I mean, I grew up believing I was not good enough from very, very young. And that I also grew up believing everything was my responsibility. And so I took on a lot and I, I pushed myself. You're the eldest? To be, I'm the oldest. And so I pushed myself to be enough um, in the ways that I could 
uh, I believe that if I wasn't a boy, I would never really be loved. So my rules for success were failure because I could never be a boy. <laughs> um, and so I try to achieve, I try to achieve academically, I try to achieve in, in the ways that I could. Uh, this was all based on my perceptions and not really the truth, but I believed that I wasn't good enough. Um, and I had some really major moments in my life that that shaped me when I was about two years old. I was sick a lot from age two to four. I was in hospital a lot. Um, I needed to be in an oxygen tent. And I remember the one day I had a, a, a really strict nurse come to me. I was crying because I they, they had really strict visiting hours and I was little and I was crying because I wanted my parents. And she was really harsh. And she said, if you don't stop crying and you're not a good girl, I'm not going to let your parents come and visit you and you're going to be stay here forever. Oh my God. And, and I was, I was traumatized. And I, um, I learned from very young that I need to be a good girl and I need to please people if, if I want to you know, my family around if I want to be loved. So that was just one of many moments like that that shaped me. Um, and when I was 14 years old, I came home from school one day and I found in my room a letter on pink lined paper in written in blue ink. My mom had written me a letter, a two-page letter. And I read the letter and realized it was a suicide note. And... I'll never forget. It was one of the most terrifying moments of my life. I adored my mother. Um, I don't remember finding my mom. My mom was fine. Um, I just remember that night, uh, we spent the night in some really dodgy hotel. I think my mom must have had an argument with my dad. They had conflict my whole childhood. Um, and I remember staying up the whole night thinking, how do I help my mom? I don't know how to help her. And if I don't help her, she's going to die. And if she dies, I won't survive. And so from very young, I had this deep desire to take away her suffering, to help her, um, you know, because she's my family, I need her, it's important. So for me, helping family, being a good daughter and helping my mother became a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was the, the void that has driven me to learn to be enough. So that was the one thing. And then um, at many moments when I eventually had a child, um, he was a year old. I had two boys at that stage. I told you my boys are 10 months apart. And um, the one day the little one had a, the older one had a, a seizure and he nearly died and we had to rush him to the hospital. And in the car, I thought he was going to die. He wasn't breathing. And he was okay that we, 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 we got him, the doctor sorted him out. But in those moments, I felt helpless as a mother. And so I always felt like I wasn't good enough as a daughter. Before having kids, I had fertility problems. They told me I'd have, never have children. I thought I wasn't good enough as a wife. You know, the story plays out. The more you believe something, the more that starts to become re your reality. Um, so I always had this drive to want to be good enough. And so at first it was, you know, how do I be the perfect mother and, and have perfect children and do everything perfectly and um, and be the perfect daughter and um, and then and a perfect businesswoman and make lots of money and be healthy and beautiful and fit and time with the kids. And I mean, it's it's impossible. And it led to um, depression. It led to burnout. It led to um, just so much in a conflict of me just not coping. Um, and so that's that began the journey of a real inner journey for me and a spiritual journey. And um, re eventually realizing that nothing on the outside is going to um, be enough and that the real work is an inner journey shifting your mindset and, and, you know, learning to open my heart and love myself has been the journey. And so I started to do courses and I did a course that changed my life 17 years ago so profoundly. And I knew this is exactly what I've been looking for. And this is what I'm here to do. I, I want to share this with other people and particularly with mothers. Was that the breakthrough experience? Yeah. That I had was done lots first of other ever course? But no, it wasn't my first course. It was the first course that was that profound. Okay. And that we saw significant changes in my outer reality within a few weeks of doing the inner work. And, and so I immediately became trained as a facilitator. I've been a student of Demartini's ever since. I've been, and I've been coaching ever since. And so now I do get to teach, which is what I was born to do. Um, and yeah, the journey has always been first to empower myself as a means of empowering my children, because I believe my mother was disempowered. Uh, when I was born, my mom, um, 
my mom loved me dearly. My both my parents love me dearly. They still do. They love me dearly. Um, but my for three weeks I just lost weight and I was basically starving to death. Um, my mom couldn't breastfeed, so she was bottle feeding, but I would have very little and then I would just sleep. I wasn't eating. And eventually she took the bottles and the formula and everything to the clinic and they realized that the teat in the hole was too small and so I would suck and suck and suck until I until I was exhausted and fall asleep and I'd only get a few mils so I was I was I was starving and um so from very little I think I took on the responsibility of I need to care my take care of myself and even that was a moment of life or death and so while my mom has loved always loved us dearly I grew up perceiving that she was very disempowered and that I need to be the strong one and I need to become empowered. Um, and so that's what drove me. And then wanting to do it differently until I learned to resolve my childhood issues. You know, I, want, I wanted to do it all differently for my, my children and be the perfect mom until I realized that that's a fantasy. <laughs> and that's been part of the journey. <laughs> Is it a fantasy? I mean, I really want to go off in two tangents here because almost you letting go of the fantasy of being the perfect mom has allowed you to be the perfect mom, right? Whereas when you were really trying to put all of those pieces in place, you like there was would have been so much resistance and inner struggle. Um, mm-hmm. I want to go back to something you said when you were explaining your journey. What did depression look like for you, Louise? Um, it was mild depression. I had two small kids. I struggled to fall pregnant and all I ever wanted, all I ever wanted was to be a mom from very young. I wanted to get married and and have children and I have the most amazing husband. Um, In two weeks time, I've been with my husband for 34 years. He's my soulmate. I adore him. Um, And we had been together for 10 10 years when we decided to start trying for kids. Um, And I really struggled and had two years of fertility and our first son is an in vitro baby. Um, I felt pregnant with twins. I lost the one. It was quite traumatic. And I ended up having two beautiful, healthy, really good and easy babies, but two in 10 months, which is tough. I think it's harder than twins. And (laughs) I felt so guilty because I wasn't happy all the time because Mm -hmm. I was exhausted. I was trying to be the perfect mom. I was still running a business. I went back to work when my first son was a week old because that's one of the downsides. Well, at that stage of running my business, I thought I needed to do it all myself. Um, I don't do that anymore. Um, And so I just didn't cope. And so I went on to antidepressants, but it was mild. But I was living the perfect life on the outside and felt so guilty because I wasn't happy all the time. I couldn't understand why am I not happy all the time? Why am I not grateful for this life? Why am I still looking for more? Um, So, yeah, it was only it wasn't long that I was on antidepressants. it was a few years later that I did the breakthrough experience and everything changed for me. Um, Am I allowed to ask you what you worked on at the breakthrough experience? That first one? It's a huge part of my journey. Um, Can we explain what the breakthrough experience is? We should probably explain what the breakthrough is. Yes. (laughs) So it's a course, it's a two-day course that is taught by Dr. John Martini. And he teaches about human behavior and universal laws. And he teaches a method called the Demartini method that helps you to dissolve emotions and balance out um, issues that you might have specifically around one person. He teaches you to do it with one person. You can then apply it to um, every area of your life. It can be used for so many different things. Uh, it's very, very powerful, very effective, the most effective tool I've I've ever come across still. I've learned from lots of teachers and continue to. It's still one of the most powerful tools that I know. So I worked on my mother because three years before that, I had an argument with my father, who was very domineering. So in my growing up, I had a very domineering um, father who I was terrified of. And then I had a very oversupportive mother who I adored. And, you know, kind of created the the villain and the saint out of the two of them. Um, and I had an argument with my dad and we ended up not speaking to each other for three years. I didn't see my mom and my dad and my brothers for three years. And family is the most important thing to me. So that was a really, really um, big challenge in my life. I cried every day for three years. Um, 
but I had I had my husband and I had my two kids and so it ended up there were many many blessings that came from that I just couldn't see it at the time mm -hmm. and so when I did the breakthrough and we had to choose someone I was actually more angry at my mom because my mom had always said that nothing will ever come between us nothing because my mother grew up having conflict with her parents and having years where she didn't speak to her parents and my mother actually as a child for six months her and her, and her siblings were sent to an orphanage it's a long story, but my, they ended up going back to my, to my to their parents after six months. But it was very traumatic for my mom as the oldest, and she took on that um, she needs to be a people pleaser and a good girl in order to keep the family together. And so she said, no matter what happens, this will never ever ever happen to my family, and whatever we don't love, repeats. And so that became a, a generational um, cycle. I can go back and tell you that how this goes back in further generations. Just, yeah. Can you just repeat that? Whatever we don't love, repeat. Repeat. Yeah. Yes. So, so I think it will, if you're will listening to this, yeah, you've probably heard about shadow work before. And um, I mean, we're going to get into, uh, Louise and I are going to talk a little bit about guilt and shame in a minute. But if you um, really don't love an experience and really, and I know that this sounds quite difficult and maybe uncomfortable to hear, but those experiences that are not so pleasant at the time, there is a really divine message in it. And it's when we love it, we essentially get to close the loop of it happening. Is that correct? Yeah. I think, I think people understand it as, as healing it or, or transcending it or transforming it. Um, the language that we use is eventually you learn to love it and you're grateful for, for every challenge. Um, so yes, uh, my mother had the trauma of of not seeing her family and that became the most important thing and then that ended up happening the very thing that she didn't want to happen happened with us and I was really angry because she'd said she'd never let anything come between us so I was more angry at her and so I did this process on my mom and had no idea what to expect and I had not seen them for three years and I was six months pregnant with my daughter when I did this course the first time and so it's quite interesting because I did the process on my mom and I was pregnant with my daughter. And now when I look back, I mean, it, it can bring tears to my eyes because I was so being guided <laughs> and I had no idea that my work was going to become generational work and, and healing and healing families. I had no idea. I was just there to try and not be, suffer as much as I was suffering at that point in time. And it was profound. By the end of it, I was so grateful for my mom. I felt so much love. I could see a perfection in all of it, in not seeing my family. Um, I was a bit confused because I went to um, Di Martini afterwards and I said to him, um, I really feel grateful for my mom, but I'm not sure I want to see her. And he said, well, that's not the point. The point is not that you now need to mend the relationship. The point is that it no longer runs you, that you feel love and, and gratitude and you can move on. If you choose to see or not, that's up to you. But that's not the point of doing the work. The point is to free yourself and heal it within yourself. So that was liberating. On the Monday morning, my mother phoned my office looking for me. I mean, that is an incredible synchronicity. I wasn't there, so I didn't speak to her. And then I spent the next week doing the process on my dad. And my husband had done the course with me, so he helped me. And by the end of the week, my dad was a tough one to finish. By the end of the week, I felt completely grateful for my dad and saw my dad in a way that I had never seen before and had a deep love and appreciation for my dad um, because I was so blinded to him, me thinking he needed to be one way and, and feeling so challenged by him growing up and then seeing how much that shaped me and how grateful I was and how strong I am and confident and how much I've learned and grown and my success all because of his challenge, the, 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 the balance of my mom and my dad's support and challenge. So I did the process on my dad and three weeks later, my dad, who's a very proud and stubborn man, emailed me and said, I think we should resolve things. And that, it was a miracle. They had no idea what I had done. They had no idea how much it shifted within me. And that for me was just mind blowing. I already knew that this is the work I want to do, but that was a confirmation of this is so big when it shifts in you, it shifts in the other person, whether they're aware of it or not. By entanglement, when you dissolve the emotion, it dissolves in them. And that is so empowering. Um, so I didn't go and see them 
for for a while because like, I was nervous I was like I don't know if I want to go back to my old way of being and I've healed so much and I still had all these stories anyway three three months later just before I had my daughter I went to see them everything was different um, and so and my daughter played a massive role in a way in actually bringing us together because I didn't want to have my daughter without my parents around and so that was a very healing part of our journey I have my whole body is like just keep shivering every like when you draw those connections together did you have you told your daughter this uh she knows I haven't gone into a, a lot of she knows yeah hmm. um so I think you you touched on something really important there when you really understand that work and the learn to love the things inside you you shift you do shift things for other people or we can shift things for other people and so Louise can you talk a little bit about you know when we start to feel that maybe something needs to change something in our world needs to change it's really easy to point the finger and be like well they're doing this or you know they're upsetting me how can we reframe that or how can we look at that in a different light so when people challenge us, it's because we have a, a set of values and we have a, a set of expectations on how we think people should show up in our lives. And we expect people to be one-sided when nobody is one-sided. Nobody is always nice, always kind, always caring, always patient. Nobody's always the opposite either. Nobody's always mean, always impatient, always inconsiderate, always selfish. Everybody is a balance of nice and mean, kind and caring, supportive and challenging, depending on how you treat them and depending on, on um, whether you support or challenge their values. So if you're nice to somebody, you know, if you walk past a mother and you see her with a child and you say, oh, you've got the most beautiful baby. She looks so clever. She's beautiful. She's bubbly. She must get it all from you. <laughs> you're going to open up and smile and think she's a nice person. If you, you walk past a, a mother with a child and you, you know, you criticize the child and say, what an ugly child. And she looks really um, unintelligent and you know like I don't know where you found her and she kind of looks like you and you're not too attractive either um, you would close down and you would and the worst of you would come out so everybody is nice and mean um, everybody has two sides but we tend to want the one side we tend to want support we tend to want ease we want people to support us to be nice to us we expect them to be one-sided and nobody really teaches us this that that people are meant to, we're meant to, we, we meant to have both sides. It's a universal law. It's it's how nature shows up. You, you don't get night without day, summer without winter, hot without cold, you know, rain and sunshine, um, predator and prey. We need both to make us grow. So most people don't understand this. So we have an expectation for people to show up one way. And when they don't, and they don't support our values and um, you know, I expected my dad to show his love by by doing things I wanted to do. My dad loved soccer. I had two brothers, so we lived on the soccer field. I believed he didn't love me because we because we spent all the time soccer and he was watching soccer and coaching my boys to play soccer and I felt left out. So my perception was if I'm not a boy, I'm not loved and my dad doesn't love me because he's not supporting my values and doing it in the way that supports me. Um, so... The understanding is it's so important to know that when somebody is challenging you, there is an upside. So, so now we're getting into deep into the work that every challenge helps us grow. And so I had grew up had having an oversupportive mother. I had a mother who was terrified of conflict because of her traumas as a childhood. When her parents uh, split, they ended up in an orphanage. And so she was terrified of conflict and would avoid conflict at all costs. And when you try and avoid something, the very thing you avoid, the very thing that you resist, the very thing that you haven't learned to love is the thing that will keep you will keep attracting. And so the more my mother tried for us to have a peaceful home, the more we had my father playing out the other side to break our addiction to a peaceful home, to a one sided home. We didn't understand this. And he would challenge us. And the reason being, we need a balance of challenge and support to make us grow. We're not here to have a happy life. We're here to learn to grow. We're here to learn to overcome. We're here to learn to be authentic, to be ourselves, to love and to contribute in a way that's meaningful. That's what we're really here for. And if we're only ever supported, if we had 
parents that supported us, both parents, our entire lives, our siblings, our teachers, our friends, if they only ever supported us, we'd never grow. We'd never grow in our self-worth. We'd never grow in resilience. We'd never, we'd never learn to take on challenges. So life is designed to give us a balance. And this is, this is going into family dynamics. You will always have a balance of challenge and support in a family dynamic. We just don't understand it. And we think, well, what's wrong? Why can't both parents be nice? Why does someone have to challenge us? If, um, you know, if, you, if you're married and you're in a relationship, if you have a good day at work and someone's puffing you up, when you come home, your partner is going to criticize you and bring you back to balance. And then you think, geez, I was having such a good day. I should have just stayed at work. Mm. No, they're there to bring us back to balance so that we can stay authentic, so that we can love and contribute in a way that's authentic and meaningful. So it's really easy, I think, for you and I to sit here and be like, yes, absolutely. We understand this dynamic because we've worked through X amount of charges so that we have started to see the divinity in things. What happens when, you know, somebody's just hearing this for the first time and, you know, life is really hard and they're being, they feel like they're being challenged at every single angle. How can we start to have the conversation that there are both sides there? So first of all, it's to acknowledge where people are at and, and pe people, if people are having a tough time, that's, that's normal and it's human. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, I think it's so important to let people be where they're at and to acknowledge how they're feeling and to have compassion, but then to bring um, a different perspective. And, and so this is not something that's easy to do on a podcast, but by helping people to, to look at things differently and to start to go and ask the right questions, like how could this be helping me? How could this um, be serving me? How's this helping me in what, I, what is most meaningful to me in my mission? Um, how's this helping me grow? What am I learning from this? Who is supporting me? Where are the blessings? Because in every challenge, there are blessings. In every crisis, we have an upside. So a couple of years ago, we had someone very close to us pass away and it was very sad. And for a long time, this person was in the hospital and I was so aware of this paradox that was happening while we were hugely challenged and, and so devastated and so sad. I watched as well where there was beauty and where people were connecting and people were making new friendships and people were being supported. And I could see the two happening at the same time. And so it's about helping people to start to go, okay, you might be going through hell. You might have had the, the, the toughest month of your life. Who was there? Who was supporting you? Um, what were the upsides? You know, um, what did you learn? How did you grow? And to start to look at, it's not about taking a, a negative thing and saying, oh, it was actually a good thing. It's about equilibrating it because life is not about positive thinking. It's not about negative thinking. It's about balanced thinking. And when we're balanced, we can be grateful. We can be authentic. We can be present. We have more certainty because the truth is life is balanced. There's things you like about yourself and things you don't like about yourself. There's things you like about your parents and things you don't like about your parents. Even if you have the most amazing kids, there's things you like about them and things you don't <laughs> like about them. Or you know, husband or wife. So it's about learning to balance our thinking. And that allows us to um, let go of and dissolve the charge, you know, the negative charge as, as much as it is, and it lightens the load. So that's a that's a simplified version. Mm -hmm. um, I would go into more detail in a coaching session, but for no, that podcast, was really beautiful, I, really beautifully I articulated. Can you maybe, you know, with your work that you do with women and families, what are some of the common challenges you see women facing? I mean, you touched on um, people pleasing for yourself. What are some of the other ones we see women commonly experiencing? So mom guilt is huge, is is really one of the biggest ones. And I, I had that too. Um, that comes from trying to live up to some kind of fantasy or ideal that we think um, uh, that we learn from society, uh, that we, we compare ourselves to other people and we only see what we see. We don't see what happens behind closed doors. Um, thinking, you know, social media is, is a real issue because you see this beautifully posed photograph of some woman who's all dressed up and most beautiful kids with, with toys or whatever, and you don't see what happens behind the scenes. So mom guilt is huge. 
thinking we need to be a certain way, it also comes from unresolved issues from our past. So whatever we haven't loved about our childhood with from our, our mothers, our fathers, you know, we all think we're going to do it better. We're going to do it differently. Whatever we haven't loved about our childhood, we think, well, I'm going to do it the right way. I'm, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to do it the right way. And what happens to most people <laughs> when their parents after a certain amount of time is they eventually go, oh my God, I have just become like my mother or oh my God, I've just become like my father. The very thing we didn't want to do, we do. Um, the very I'm, thing have, I'm just do. like, oh my God, oh my God, Louise. <laughs> it started happening to me. I'm like, wow, that was something my mum would do. And now you've just <laughs> connected the dots for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Continue, it's, sorry. It's, yeah, it's whatever we haven't owned, what we're disowning within ourselves. So um, guilt is assuming that we cause more pain than pleasure, more challenge than support, more loss than gain. And we don't because I've just explained how we need a balance of challenge and support in our lives. So let's say mother's had a long day and she comes home and the child does something and she loses her temper and she shouts and screams. And, and then afterwards she feels guilty because why didn't she handle that differently? She could have been calm. She could have been more present. You know, is that going to traumatize the child? Um, instead of realizing that coming home and, and shouting and screaming at the kids, the, the, the child's learning something. The child's learning to deal with conflict. The child's learning resilience. Don't underestimate the genius of a child from, from, from birth. They are, I mean, a, a baby knows exactly how to get what it needs. So, um, and this idea that if we over support our children, um, they won't grow and they won't become resilient and they won't be able to be leaders in the world. So they need a, a, a balance. And so guilt, the way to dissolve that is to understand that no matter what you do, there's an upside and that um, as long as you have the intention and all mothers do, all fathers do, every parent is doing the best that they can. They love their children. And as long as they're loving their children, it doesn't matter what they do, the children will be okay. They learn to be resilient. They learn to adapt. If they are getting conflict at home, they're likely to get support from the other parent or from a sibling or from a friend. So it's one half of an equation. And guilt is assuming, oh, my word, I did all these bad things and there was no upside and there was no one supporting the child or doing the opposite. So, um, you know, if parents are fighting and, 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 and irritable with the kids, the children are likely to be supporting each other. So there's always a support as well if they know how to look for it, if they know how to see it. And this is what you know I, I teach women to do is, is to balance that. Because what happens is we feel guilty, then we overcompensate. Then moving forward, now we're trying to be too nice. So because I came home yesterday and I screamed at the kids, today I'm going to come home, buy them toys, give them des dessert, because now I want them to love me. That's the other problem is that as parents, we want our children sometimes to be our friends and to like us we're not we're not meant to be like we're meant to be parents we're meant to teach them and we're meant to be authentic and 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 be our two-sided selves because imagine you could have a one-sided parent who was always nice always kind always caring if your mother was like that you would grow up thinking what's wrong with me why can't I be like my mother my mother's perfect and I'm and I'm not one-sided it's so it's it's it gives you freedom to be yourself because you're also going to lose your temper sometimes. You're also going to shout. You're also going to get upset with people. It's normal. It's important that we learn to, to understand that being human is being perfect. So, you know, these ideals of, you know, of, of being a perfect parent, this idea of conscious parenting, all these new age things of doing it differently, they can they can cause unrealistic expectations and fantasies. So uh, so when you, you started the call and you said, well, is being a perfect parent a fantasy? Perfect in the in the way we think we should be, but actually the way we are is perfect. And every parent is the perfect parent for their child. Every mother is the perfect mother for their child, even if they can't see it at that point in time. There is a perfection. There is a higher order. There is a divinity. There is a beauty. So my mother leaving me a suicide note at age 14 led me on this journey where I now do what I love. I, 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 this is my calling and I get to empower so many families and I get to teach moms who then teach their children. And I saw I sorted out my mother issues and I don't have that with my daughter now. So she doesn't have to. And I help women deal with their parent issues so their children don't have to. 
And so we are shifting, we're transforming things. So there's a, there's a beautiful perfection. And if we don't, that has a perfection too. I feel like I need to go and call my mom right now and tell her I loved her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, That's the point. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, my mom had a really, my mom had a really challenging upbringing and, you know, therefore my upbringing was exactly what you spoke about. You know, everything that she didn't have, you know, she just wanted to give us everything. And I look at the, you know, really the relationship that my mother and I have now, she's my best friend. She is my person. You know, we are closer. That's definitely not the childhood I had, but right now, you know, she is, we are very close and that's what she gave me. When we look at the generation of, when I look back at my generations, because she's not close with her mother, she was never close with her mother. And now I have that with her. That's the thing that I'm most grateful for. Mm. Yeah. So it's really, again, when you talk about, you know, being that perfect mother and trying in the trying to give them the child, the perfect life, it's not necessary. Like, yeah, it's not the nest. It's not necessarily that thing that you're giving them, but there will be another gift in there. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is that that's, that's not even possible. You know, if you try and do things differently, you know, like, so my father used to scream at us so much that my brother used to wet himself when he was a little boy because he was scared. My, my, and my mother, my mother exaggerated my dad because my mother, mother was so scared of conflict. Then she would teach us, you must be good. You must be good. Don't upset dad. And so we were, we were extra terrified. My dad actually isn't a monster. My dad's a lovely man, but he would sometimes shout and scream and we couldn't deal with that. And, and, and he would challenge us. Um, and we couldn't deal with that because we, we thought we were supposed to just have a supportive childhood. So there was a phase where I, I started the thing I didn't love that I didn't want to be I started screaming at my children when they were little and I would be just like my dad and I hated it about myself um, and the more I tried to not shout and scream and and to be this kind calm parent I was able to do it for a period of time but I was repressing all the little times that I was irritated and I was upset and eventually I would have a huge outburst so the more you try and repress there will eventually be an expression and then I would lose the plot and then I would be the, a monster of a mother shouting screaming swearing then the guilt would start <laughs> then I would try and overcompensate so there's this whole cycle of instead of just being yourself being able to say what you need to say even if it upsets the, the person being authentic there's less of the extreme polarized polarizations when you are able to just be yourself and be a balance of nice and mean of you know patient and impatient can we talk about how and this might not, you know, how this is evolutionary as well. You know, you didn't do one breakthrough experience, work on your mom, then work on your dad. And all of a sudden, all of your relationships dynamics have changed. This is something that sort of unfoils as you go, isn't it? Yeah. So listen, I did, I did one process on my mom and then one process on my dad that were so profound that that would have been enough to get to I mean that resolved our relationship but then when you're in a relationship with you know we change we evolve and then new things come up and then there's new things that push our buttons um and then there's memories that come up and these things from our childhood that come up um so this is an infinite journey this is this is a never-ending journey it's not like you you learn certain things you do some work and then you you've mastered your life and now you're you're living this life of contentment and you never get triggered it that's that's not being human and that's not possible if anybody tells you that you will get to a point where your life is perfect and you're happy all the time run, <laughs> run. Um, it's a it's an infinite journey so I've done this process on my mom many times um, I've done it on my dad a few times I've done it on my daughter myself you know all my kids um, and so as things come up there's layers and we work through it uh, it's not to say that one process cannot be hugely, um, hugely profound. You know, you can you can deal with you can resolve one childhood trauma, and that never comes up, and then that has a ripple effect in so many areas of your life. So, some of it is 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 huge, and you may never need to do more. Uh, it also depends on you know what's meaningful to you and how you want to work through things. Some people don't; they just want to then move on and create their life, and that's okay. As things then come up, if there's challenges, then they will look at, okay, well, why am I not being able to, you know, build wealth or, you know, take care of my health or why do I feel like I have low energy or why am I depressed? Then there's more work to do. Um, 
So, but it is, you know, this is a journey of personal mastery and that really is an infinite journey. Absolutely. Um, I have another question for you. When you start understanding these dynamics and understanding the universal laws, how do you, you know, this can work, this question can work for both mothers and daughters. How do you, um, how do you know, um, let me think about wording this question. How do you start then um, parenting your children when you know that these dynamics are at play and you can kind of witness these things happening in front of you, but you can't intervene, but also in terms of maybe you're the daughter and you're watching, you know, you've started doing work, you know, you're an adult daughter, you've started doing the work on yourself and you're then watching these dynamics evolve in your parents. And we all know when we start doing the work, we want to just tell everyone to do the thing and, you know, everyone's going to change and live happily ever after. So how do you allow these things to come up naturally and organically? I love this question because this has been so important to me because I did this course when I was pregnant with my daughter 17 years ago and my boys were three and four at the time. Um, and I thought, oh, my God, I've been parenting wrong. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing I asked um where's the reset how, button <laughs> the first thing I asked is how do I teach this to my children mm-hmm. and John answered with a question that changed my life and he said if you want to raise inspired and empowered children if you want to teach them a new way of being you do this through exemplification you live the work you live it you become it and they learn from what you do and not from what you say And so many of us as parents, and I still do it sometimes, like I'll tell my children to do something I'm not doing. (laughs) They, I mean, my children call me out. So my children, so from very young, I started to teach them principles. As, As things happened, I mean, I'm a born teacher. So, you know, that we'd be sitting at the table and every day we talk about our blessings of the day. I started to teach them what are the blessings. And then I would ask, okay, so what, what was challenging today? What was bad about today? And then I would help them to find the upside in in the challenge and so as things would happen my daughter would come home and she'd say oh so and so didn't want to play with me today and I'd go instead of going oh she's so nasty how could she not want to play with you which probably I would have done in the past as an overprotective mom don't worry you're so sweet um or shame my darling that's terrible I would say well who did want to play with you and and what was the benefit of playing with her Oh, you actually wanted to play catches. So you got to play catches with your other friend. That's fine. Tomorrow you can play with. And so I taught her to look for the other side from very young. So I taught all my kids. I I taught them these principles. Um, So my children are very empowered. My husband understands this work as well, which helps. Um, It has its own downsides. So raising empowered children and inspired children, they will tell you. They will be the first to tell you. My, My oldest son says it's really hard to have a life coach as a mom. They feel pressure to be a certain way, which is not what I expect, but they do. Um, So going back to the answer, the way to make a difference is to to apply this work ourselves, is to do the inner work ourselves, is to not, the whole point of this is not to change anyone. It's not even to change ourselves. It's to change our perceptions, to love ourselves. And eventually, how we see others starts to change and there's less of a need to change. And then they start to see you and they start to go, what are you doing? Like, tell me more. Like you've, you've changed. There's something about you. They start to listen. They start to be more open. But so the hardest part is letting go of, oh my God, this can fix you. And if you do this, our relationship will be great. <laughs> no, the, that's not the point. The point is you do the work. They don't need to change. Then you just love them for who they are. And when you learn to love people for who they are, they turn into who you love. And that's the journey. So this doesn't only apply to your children or to you and your parents. This applies to anybody in your life. This is this is universal. It's the hardest thing, I think, as well in doing the work to to, to just I know for my I'm absolutely speaking from my own opinion and perception here that um yeah when you feel challenged by something and you fix it well you you know see the divinity in it you see the balance in it um to yeah not just want to do all the things and just allow the moment to be well understanding family dynamics you need to understand that in a family 
um, there's going to be some of you that are interested in this kind of work and some of you that are, are completely opposed. There's going to be both. There's, there's a balance in a family dynamic. You get the introvert and the extrovert. You get the academic and the sporty. You get the super healthy and the one that just wants to eat and watch Netflix. You're going to have a balance of values in a family dynamic. And so there may be one that's that's really interested in personal development and you know spiritual journey. And then there's going to be someone that is so anti that thinks, thinks the other person's crazy. It's going to be both. In, in a family dynamic and they and it's perfect they all serve we need we need all of it we do I mean you just described my brother and I perfectly thank you <laughs> <laughs> um and when I think about you know the women that I work with they have similar dynamics and you know the women that I work with have the biggest hearts like you know of all of the women that I ever get to meet and so they feel the pain as well they really feel um, you know, I think when we talk about challenges, we really feel um, it sounds more like a conflict, but it can also be a really big pain and sadness. Um, and I know that when these challenges come up for them, there's a huge amount of sadness. Mm. Um, and, that, and that's normal. That That's okay. That's part of what's shaping them. That's part of, it's not easy. It's not what we want. It's not what we choose. We don't always get what we want, but we get what we need. And there is a bigger picture. And so if you're the one supporting them, then there's going to be someone else challenging. Um, there is there is a, a matrix of love that's happening um, that we learn to see. But feeling the pain and, you know, this is, this is because we understand there's a bigger picture and there's a way to see blessings in a challenge doesn't mean the challenge is not hard. Doesn't mean it doesn't change you and it doesn't shape you. That's the point. And it doesn't mean that you don't need support and compassion and you can't get angry and cry. And I mean, that's all part of it. Whatever that brings up for you creates something. You know, the pain of my childhood led to me wanting to do whatever I could to, to empower myself so that I can empower families. It still comes from that pain of me as a little girl. The thing that moves me more than anything is when I hear that I'm working with a mother that has a little girl or I've had occasionally now where the, where the mother says, will you work with my little girl? I mean, and it's not to say that I don't care about little boys. I have boys like, and, and I don't work with fathers. I do, you know, and men, but the little girl is the most meaningful because that's my pain point. So even though I've healed it, it's, it's still there. Absolutely. Um, what do you, what advice do you have for women listening to this and getting curious, Louise? First of all, just I want to say that to every woman, to know that they are perfect just the way they are, that they have upsides and downsides and strengths and weaknesses, and they don't need to change. You don't need to get rid of half of yourself to love yourself. So if you can learn to love yourself a little more, to accept what you think um, is bad about you, to see that sometimes it serves you know if someone comes in and they're challenging your family if someone breaks in and your and your children are at risk you need to be strong and aggressive and whatever you need to do to protect your family you need the you know the, the what you would call the negative side to come out everything serves or it wouldn't still exist there's nothing in nature that doesn't exist that doesn't still have a place everything is part of a much bigger circle of nature and matrix of love that we don't always understand so first of all just to learn to love yourself and then to really get to know what is most meaningful to you what your real values and priorities are because as women and this happens to men too but more as women we tend to want to be pleasers we want to be liked and we have an idea of how we should be um and particularly mothers this can happen um is is you know, there's women that have that have values that aren't just being a mother. And when when so my highest value when my kids were born was actually finance because my parents liquidated three times when I was little. And um so I worked 24-7. That's why I was back at work when my son was a week old. And my way of loving my children was to be at work. And so it wasn't that I didn't value my family, but finances were so important to me that I thought if we didn't have finance, my family would break apart another part of of a childhood um, void that I had um, so it's about understanding what your real values are and then being your authentic self because even when you're trying to please people 
you can't please everybody. So you're going to please, you know, let's say you please your husband, you might upset your boss or you might upset your kids or you might upset your parents or some friends. If you try and please a friend, you might upset somebody else. We can't please everybody. There's going to be people that are happy and sad at the same time with us. And so to learn to be authentic and honor our own values and what our, where our heart and soul is guiding us, that's the journey. That's what we would want for our children. We would want our children to follow their hearts and do what is most meaningful and inspiring. That's how leaders are born. People that are authentic and following and true to their heart are the most magnetic. We want to be around them, even though they're not always nice. They're, they're two-sided. We can, we can feel that they are real. We can feel that they have heart. And that's what we want for our children. And the way we do that is to do that for ourselves. Why would we not treat ourselves the way you would want to treat your little boy or your little girl? So the test would be, would I want that for my children? Like, don't sacrifice your life for your children if you wouldn't want your children to do the same. So that's a really good test. I think there's going to be some people that are going to find that really hard to hear. Um, how do we, how do we figure out what we truly value and what brings us joy? So that takes some work because we often, um, are not clear because we have fears and we have unresolved issues from the past and, um, and we subordinate, we look at, we look at other people and we think, well, I should be more like them, you know, why? and when we are using language, like I should, I need to, I must, I mustn't, I have to. Um, those are indications that they're not really most meaningful. When we use language like, I can't wait to, I will, I'm going to, um, I am, those are, we, that's the indication that we're aligned. That's what's most meaningful. But there's sometimes there's fears of, you know, I used to say, well, I can't just be a mother um, when actually I was born to just be a mother <laughs> and a teacher. Um, and so, it's to look at our language and then get feedback every day. You know, at the end of the day, go, what was most inspiring? What gave me energy? What energized me? Um, what would I rather be doing? What do I love to talk about? What do I love to spend money on? Those are the things that are meaningful to us. The, the, the things where we go, well, you know, I'd really love to do this course, but actually I should save or actually I should, um, you know, spend the money on my child or whatever it is. Um, when we're, when we're using that language, it's what we call imperative language, and it's a sign that we're not being authentic. Um, but our life will give us feedback because our, our true values will shine through. So, you know, I've tried my whole life to, to be fitter and I'm like, I, okay, I should start running. And I might start running and I might run for a week or two and then eventually it fizzles out or gym or whatever it is or a diet and eventually it fizzles out because it's not most meaningful. Whatever is most meaningful, you will do no matter what's going on in your life. So I've been sick for the last few weeks and I did nothing in bed except learn and do more courses on coaching and learning about family <laughs> dynamics. But even when you are man down, you will still do the things that are most meaningful. I still spent time with my family. I still made an effort with my family. So that the things that were most meaningful are never missing. And it's to look at that long term. If you look at what was most missing in your life, in your childhood, the pain points, those are often the ones that shape you and become meaningful moving you forward. And so that's feedback. And then you'll get things like tears of inspiration. You'll have moments, you'll watch movies, you'll see people and, and it'll really move you. And that's when it speaks to your heart and not your mind of comparing yourself and going, well, I really should, you know, dress differently or I should read more so I can be more intelligent because so-and-so is more intelligent. That's what we call subordination. That's not being true and honoring who you really are. That leads to burnout, resentment, all kinds of issues. Yeah, that yeah, that's not fun at all. Um, Louise, thank you so much for this conversation. I really hope that the women listening and maybe even the men have taken away the most beautiful gold nuggets because there are so many in here. And I know that even I'm going to go back and listen to it Um that you had me in tears, nearly in tears a couple of times. So thank you very much for the work that you do and having this conversation with me today. Thank you. Such a gift to she. Is there anything that you would like to finish up on? Um, no, no, Just, it's all, love. it's all love. Um, it's all love. Yeah. Thanks Louise.